Okie dokie guys, so this is intermolecular forces. There's a little diagram here to show you what type of intermolecular forces we've got. There's three main types. There's hydrogen bonds, which not, are not actually classed as bonds, they're actually classed as forces, even though the name says bonds in it. So watch out for that one. Hydrogen bonds aren't a bond, they're an intermolecular force. We've also got van der Waals forces, small v, small d, capital W. And there's actually two different types of van der Waals forces. There's London dispersion forces. Now these are also called, deep breath, instantaneous induced dipole-dipole forces. And we'll get to why that is later. Another type of van der Waals force is the permanent dipole-dipole force. And all I'm going to talk about today is what causes each of these forces and their relative strengths compared to each other. So just to think about their strengths, intermolecular forces are very, very weak. Compared to bonds, ionic, covalent and metallic bonds, all of these are incredibly weak, very, very weak. So when I'm talking about their strengths today, what I'm talking about is their strengths compared to each other. If we were to compare these to even a weak metallic bond, for example, these would all still be very, very small, very low, okay, in terms of strength. So we'll start actually in the middle here with permanent dipole-dipole forces. For an intermolecular force, these are the middle ones. So they're not the weakest, which is your London. They're not your strongest, which is the hydrogen bonds. They're somewhere in the middle for an intermolecular force. And here's how they work. So let's say I've got a molecule of HCl, hydrochloric acid, and if I was to look at the electronegativities of this molecule, I would find that chlorine has got greater electronegativity. You could tell this quickly by looking at the periodic table and noticing that chlorine is closer to fluorine. With very few exceptions, the closer to fluorine you get, the more electronegative the element is. This is way more electronegative. Now, electronegativity is the ability of an element to attract a bonding pair of electrons in a covalent bond. So, as your chlorine is more electronegative, it will pull the electrons in this bond closer towards itself. I mean, when I point at this line here, if I was to actually zoom in and take a photo of this, I wouldn't see a line, I would actually see a pair of electrons. And that pair would not be in the middle, equally shared between them, it would be much closer to the chlorine. Now what's the charge of an electron? Negative. So what's that going to do to the chlorine? Well it's not going to give it a full negative charge because in order to do that the chlorine would have to completely steal them and do a run of them and go away. It's not done that. All it's done is pulled them slightly closer towards it. So what we give it is a partial charge, what we call a dipole. So the chlorine will get a negative dipole, I'll use this little delta symbol, it's like a, a zero with a little squiggle on top, and that will be the negative one, because that has the greater electronegativity, so it pulls the electrons towards it. Now the hydrogen has lost some of its electrons, it's lost some negativity, so that's going to leave it with a partial positive charge, what we call a positive dipole, and dipole is the word to use. This is called a permanent dipole because it always exists. This chlorine will always be more electronegative than that hydrogen, therefore you always have it. And then on the next molecule we're going to have exactly the same for exactly the same reason. Now what can now happen is the negative dipole from one molecule can attract the positive dipole from the neighbouring molecule. That word neighbouring is quite a good one to use if you want to describe it. And we'll just show a little dashed line uh, to show that there. So that's how you get a permanent dipole-dipole force, and like I said, they're the middle strength for an intermolecular force. Next we'll move on to London dispersion forces. These also have the name instantaneous induced dipole-dipole force. And we'll see why that is in a second. So let's say now I have the molecules H2, and I've got two of them, we'll just look at this one to begin with. Which has got the greatest electronegativity now, the hydrogen or the hydrogen? Well, obviously they're the same, they're the same element. So you might think that this molecule does not get a dipole. 
And you'd be right, it doesn't get a permanent dipole, but it can get what's called an instantaneous dipole. Now again, let's rub out this line, because we don't actually, this line doesn't actually exist. What it represents is a shared pair of electrons, the covalent bond. And let's draw these electrons in. Now, as these have got an equal electronegativity, you might say the electrons are in the middle of the bond. And I guess, on average, that would be true. But in reality, these electrons are whizzing around, you know, sometimes close to the speed of light, bombing around all over the place. So if this side of the board was one H2, and that side of the board was the other H2, and my pens were the electrons, it's not like my electrons are just stuck in the middle, equally shared. They're kind of whipping around like this. On average, they're in the middle. But if I was to stop at any given moment in time, they might be, kind of just through random chance, closer to one of the hydrogens than the others. So it might just so happen to be that my pair of electrons at this instant in time are slightly closer to this hydrogen. Now what's that going to do? That's going to give this hydrogen a, is a very, very small negative dipole. And that will give this one, because it's lost some of the electrons for that brief instant, a very, very small positive dipole. So that's the instantaneous bit, because it happens in an instant. An instant later, these electrons will wiggle back to the middle, and this dipole will be gone. An instant later, maybe the electrons will be over here, and then this will get the negative dipole, and that will get the positive dipole. So it's instantaneous, because it only happens for an instant. However, once you get just one instantaneous dipole, then because we have a delta positive here, have a little think. What will this positive do to the negative electrons in this bond in the neighbouring H2? Will it attract them or will it repel them? Well, hopefully you just thought it will attract them, opposites attract. So my negative electrons here are going to get pulled slightly closer to that positive dipole, instantaneous dipole. And so that is going to cause what we call an induced dipole in the neighbouring molecule. Induced just means make to make made so this instantaneous dipole has made a dipole has forced a dipole in the neighboring molecule and then just like before opposite dipoles attract and what you actually get is like throwing a stone into a river you get like a ripple effect so just one instantaneous dipole will induce a dipole in this molecule but then that one will induce it in the next one and then down here on the opposite side it'll do it and above and below and left and right and so it ripples out it gives an attractive force and a split second later that dipole's gone and so the rest disappear. But by the time they've disappeared, another instantaneous dipole has reappeared, and you get this ripple effect again. So throughout your gas or your liquid or whatever, everything's being constantly pulled together by these ripples of London dispersion forces. Okay? And they're very, very weak. However, you do get quite a lot of them, so they can add up to have quite significant effects. Just one extra little point which I'll briefly touch on. The more electrons you have, the stronger or the larger these instantaneous induced dipoles can be. And therefore, the stronger the London forces. So if you've got, for example, fluorine gas and chlorine gas, have a look at the periodic table. Chlorine's got more electrons in it. So it can make stronger London forces, and therefore it will have a higher melting and bonding point. But more on that in other videos. So that's London dispersion forces. The final one is hydrogen bonds. Now, with hydrogen bonds, you have to have an OH, an NH, or an FH. And the reason for that is because these are your three most electronegative elements. They're so electronegative that they can give this hydrogen a very large positive dipole. You wouldn't need to draw it any bigger than the exam, I'm just showing you there to represent what I'm saying. And of course, these would get the negative dipole. And in fact, these three elements, only oxygen, nitrogen and fluorine, can give this hydrogen such a large positive dipole that what this hydrogen can do is attract a lone pair of electrons from another oxygen, nitrogen or fluorine. So for example, let's say I had H2O, non-linear shape. Obviously, my oxygen has got two lone pairs of electrons. If you're not sure why that is, draw a down cross diagram and you'll see. I'm just going to represent them by double crosses, or double dots, I guess. The reason I use crosses is because it's harder for an examiner to miss out a cross. Sometimes they don't see dots. 
So what we've got here is my negative oxygen and my delta, pos delta negative oxygen, delta positive hydrogens. And the delta positive hydrogen from one molecule can attract the lone pair of electrons on an oxygen, nitrogen or fluorine from a different molecule. And this is called a hydrogen bond. It's actually not a bond, it's an intermolecular force. And it's, for an intermolecular force, the strongest you can get. Okay? Um, just to show you another example, it doesn't have to be an OH with an O. It could be an OH with, oh, I don't know, let's say I've got... F2. Fluorine's got three lone pairs of electrons. And so we would go from a lone pair in the fluorine to the delta positive hydrogen attached to the OH, NH, or FH. Notice though, and this, is, uh, this sounds like a really small point, but they're so anal with this, you've got to make your hydrogen bond come from between the lone pair. So you see, I was very careful to do that. And if I'd have done this, I wouldn't get a mark for that, because that's showing that just this one electron is given you need to show that both of the lone pair electrons are given there. Okay. And just one very final thing before we finish off then, which is going back to the permanent dipole forces we did at the start. If you're asked to describe what type of intermolecular force a molecule would make, I would start from the strongest and work your way down. So first of all, think, does it make hydrogen bonds? Or do we have an OH, an NH, or an FH? No. Okay, so let's move on then. Does it have a permanent dipole-dipole force? Well, we need to think what needs to happen for a molecule to be able to make a permanent dipole-dipole force. There's two things. First of all, we need a polar bond. We need a bond where the elements either side have a difference in electronegativity. So to go back to my earlier example, H2 does not make permanent dipole forces because it does not have a difference in electronegativity. We do not have a polar bond. However, there's a second thing we need to look for, and I'll use this example to show you. Let's say I had VF3, tricking on planar shape, 120 degree bond, bond angles. You might say, well, yeah, this has definitely got polar bonds. Fluorine's way more electronegative. So that'll be delta negative, permanent, and that'll be delta positive. So that should make permanent dipole forces. However, it doesn't, and the short answer is because it's symmetrical. Symmetrical molecules cannot make permanent dipole-dipole forces, and I'll show you for why. If I just draw this molecule as a blob, rough, roughly speaking, it'll be that shape. So I've got a delta negative here, delta negative here, delta negative there. Now let's draw another one of those molecules as a blob. Where's the attraction going to be? It can't attract it. You can kind of think of all of these symmetrical dipoles as cancelling each other out. So maybe now go back to your shapes lesson that you've done and have a little think about which shapes are symmetrical and which aren't. If you're not too good at shapes, get some flashcards out, have a little look at them again, spend 20 minutes on that, and then come back to this. A really important thing to remember, symmetrical molecules cannot make permanent dipoles. Okay, so that is intermolecular forces. Thanks a lot.